I'm a pharmacologist. I can tell you that uh, to develop a new drug in the field of cardiovascular diseases, first of all, it's a slow, complex, and costly process. That's what we, uh, I present to you in this slide. is pretty well known for everybody. Uh, usually, drug discovery development time is 13 to 15 years. And it is, uh, usually, we claim that if you develop or design 10,000 compounds, and I can say at the present time, if you develop 40 to 50,000 compounds, and you are lucky enough, after 13 to 15 years, and following at least 2,000 million American dollars, you can get a drug approved. So it's, I say, slow, complex, and costly. But for me, the most important point is inefficient. If now I look at the compounds that, please note, they have been analyzed in preclinical studies. They were to phase one clinical trials, and then you move to phase two or phase three studies. And please note that 59% of the compounds in phase two are abandoned because of lack of efficacy, and 22% because of uh, safety programs. And the first point is we reach evidence that the drug is inefficient despite the beautiful data on preclinical studies. And despite the drug pass phase one clinical trials. But the most difficult for me to accept is that we reach phase three clinical trials. We publish a paper in uh, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, and you see the drug is safe but ineffective. 56%. 28%, they still have problems with safety. And please note that I have here, this is 17% are not scientific reasons, are strategic, whatever it means, operational, whatever it means. And I would like to uh, talk with you a few minutes, what does it mean? Suppose that you decide to develop a, an antihypertensive compound, my advice is please don't do it. See, we have a lot of compounds. The last one, 2010, is aliscorin. I think that in my country nobody prescribed this compound. And please note that we have four blockbusters. One for beta blockers, one for ACE inhibitors, one for calcium channel blockers, and one for angiotensin receptor blockers. They are cheap generics. You cannot compete with these compounds. Two euros per month. Okay? So if you ask me my advice, please don't move into this field. So look at this. We, there are almost no, it's difficult and risky task because we have developed excellent drugs where we are dying of success in the cardiovascular field. This is just the opposite of cancer. Cancer was almost the same treatment that I studied in the School of Medicine many years ago, up to 10 years ago. But we developed beautiful compounds. The pipelines run dry in diuretics, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, statins, ACE inhibitor, angiotensin receptor blockers, because, as I already mentioned, they are excellent, easy to get them cheap generics. But at the same time, it's a risky task, because uh, two antiarrhythmics in 30 years, with a very peculiar prescription, one new drug in acute hair failure in almost 30 years, levosimendan. No sing, uh, single drug, uh, 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 single new drug in chronic uh, hair failure since 1992, sacubitril-valsartan. And if you ask me, do we have any drug for hair failure with preserved ejection fraction, the answer is very simple, no. Uh, so if we have this, this component that we have very good generics, Please compare cardiovascular with antineoplastic field. In the cardiovascular field, you can see this black bar is commercial reasons, strategical reasons. I don't want to develop new compounds for a particular disease where the, the market is saturated. It's just the opposite here in, in cancer. And this is a paper that appears in November 8 in JAMA Cardiol. You can see this is the disaster in cardiovascular field for both phase one in black, 
phase two and phase three in block. So it's more and more difficult because we have excellent compounds. So we decide to want to, why we fail, why it's so difficult. First, because we don't know the drug before we move to pivotal trials. We, we move from the paper published in Nature or Science with a very, very sophisticated identification of a target to a phase two, uh, immediately to phase three. We need to run because of the competence. Half of phase two and three uh, drug candidates fail because of lack of efficacy. So for me, phase two clinical trial has a key role to understand the drug properties. First of all, we need to confirm that the mechanism of action that has been demonstrated in animal studies, in isolated single cells, is a target in human beings. I can promise you I can get, I, I got in my lab many targets that never were confirmed in clinical practice. Target validation or is an incorrect hypothesis? It's very nice to publish a beautiful paper, but it's nonsense from the clinical point of view. Second, I need to know the pharmacodynamics. And we are always looking, uh, the, the, the modern medicine research, we look through the kaleidoscope. We develop a new anti-cancer drug. Fantastic. And we commercialize, and this is the first drug for the treatment of lung cancer or kidney cancer. Uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the patient is cured of cancer, but it's going to die of heart failure venous thromboembolism, QT prolongation, and so on. Why? Because the guy who developed the compound for cancer just looked to the cancer cell, but he forgot that this signaling pathway is also in the cardiovascular system. So what about the off-target effects of the drug? What about all the pharmacokinetics? Because the pharmacokinetics cannot be analyzed in, in, in animals cannot be analyzed in volunteers. I never prescribe a drug in a, in a healthy man or women. I prescribe in patients. We need in phase two to define the dose range, time of administration, and identify the right population. Pharmaceutical companies want a drug for all seasons. I want a drug to fit all. That's forget it. This, this is that. We need to identify a subset of patients. Pharmaceutical industries does not want to listen to this. Identify the right population most likely benefit using imaging or biomarkers as surrogate to predict the clinical efficacy and safety. To incorporate primary endpoints based on the mechanism of action in, and the right population and obtain safety data and possible drug interaction from the early beginning. This is just... Uh, what happened the last 10 years in heart failure. And as you can see, many drugs were ineffective in blue, but the problem is that these are phase three clinical trials. And in red, I can see higher rate of cardiovascular events, hypotension, new increase in thromboembolic events, increase in the risk of heart failure, seizures or stroke may impair the ventricular uh, contractility, hepatotoxicity. The question, once again, is why we reach this phase three clinical trials with all these uh, inefficient compounds and with this poor safety profile. So it's a matter of reflection. Uh, for me, nevertheless, I, I always remember my students this. Failure is simply the opportunity to begin in with, uh, this time, more intelligent. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, for me, phase two. Phase two. The pharmaceutical companies, they, they just want to jump from preclinical immediate. No, no, please. We need this phase two. Dose funding of the, the mechanism of action, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic, dose, best time, and comorbidities. And I'm a basic research uh, people, men, but mice are not men, and a cell is not a tissue. And I promise you that all my lab work on isolated cells, human or not human cells. But if I ask to the people here that work in a pharmaceutical company, which is the main problem to develop clinical trials, is this one, inefficient enrollment. So let's go. So uh, this is a challenge. 80% of clinical trials fail to meet, to meet milestones 
uh, a slow selection, a slow selection of slow and non-performing sites directly impacts the study timeline. And sponsors and CROs uh, rely on traditional recruitment or retention tactics like uh, physician referrals, consumer data from pharmacy service, site selection and support, advertisement in media, but mm, not too much. Uh, Enrollment rates vary from range from, from by region, and the range is from 78 to 98 of target levels, Asia Pacific, Latin American region, the, the highest levels. 11% of, of sites typically fail to enroll a single patient. They are very beautiful hospitals, marvelous hospitals, but they never recruit patients. 30% uh, under enroll, 39% uh, meet the enrollment targets, and 30%, 13%. Uh, do the work other people don't do. The problem is that sometimes we must be careful. This is a, a paper, this is the top cut. And you see, the uh, top cut uh, analyzed the effect of spironolactone. And the, the problem is that there was an improvement on cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization in the Americans, but not in Russia or Georgia. And now I'm, I'm European. I'm going to allow this drug to be prescribed for the Europeans. Why, why this discrepancy? Well, it appears this year in the New England. They fake. They didn't, they didn't take the pills. Look at this. The Americans, they said, 90% said, yes, I'm taking the pills. Uh, excuse me, the, the, the Russians. We take the pills. The Americans said, well, 15%, we don't, didn't follow the treatment. Jesus, now let me take the, the, the Russian and people from Georgia, and I'm going to do the following. I know that spironolactone has a metabolite. There was, uh, here in, the, in Russia, this is, excuse me, I just want to see. Here, percent of patients taking spironolactone, but they do not have the metabolite in the blood. The Russians. So if there's no metabolite, they didn't take the pill, even when they said 90% we are following the treatment. Look, the Americans. Second, why we don't measure hypo hyperkalemia? There were hyperkalemia in the Americans, but not in the Russians. So it's quite clear that this was due to the fact that the good enrolled countries fake. These are new advertisements. That's fine, because this is, this is uh, Rockefeller University Hospital. This is Oxford University. Uh, now we'll look at this. A compensation. I mean, now we open the mind. It's 900 uh, U, uh, American dollars, no cost study medication, Look now, this, uh, this is uh, in Berlin, and they said um, uh, compensation may be available for time and travel, whatever the means, you know? So the advertisement is more and more frequent. But I don't need to do that. I must, I can't remember that, that I can scan the social media. Every day, people publish millions, millions of data about themselves and we can identify the ge ge geographical distribution of possible high-quality patients and sites. There are no contact with patients, so we maintain confidentiality and coercion, and we can use software analysis to understand which is the, 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 the reaction of these people that send these messages through the net about clinical trials, about pharmaceutical companies, about the hospital where they will be referred. There are booked companies that a match a sponsor and patient interested in participating in clinical trials. There are patient organizations that offer the potential to interact with individual patients uh, uh, based on trust and unbiased information. And there are, of course, marketing campaigns that uh, use the, the, the media. A uh, third point is forget about hospitals. Don't make sense. A hospital is a very tiny institution. We need to replace site by consortium. 
a group of hospitals with unified databases, large banking, and genetic information for present and future uh, clinical trials. If people in cancer know that pretty well. For the last 10 years, we they organized as a consortium. High quality, secure, integrated information system among hospitals, and accreditation to reduce multiple inspections. And of course, we need to face uh, technical barriers, standardization of trial uh, design, a single review board committee per project, develop patient consent and the standardized form to record clinical data. Of course, this is not simple because each hospital wants to, to be important. But nevertheless, uh, I mean, even when each institution brings its own values, preferences, and interpretation of the privacy laws and to the table, I think that uh, consortium is, is the next future. The fourth point is that clinical trials are crumbling under modern economical and scientific pressure. Uh, clinical trials became unnecessarily com com complicated. We need to address the requirement of regulatory authorities, medical community, uh, payers, and patients. Uh, I like the sentence of uh, L.K. Samuels. Complexity in a system tends to increase that system inefficiency. And I think that's, that's what is happening. We make so complicated the clinical trial that it's more and more difficult to follow them. So we need fundamental changes are needed to organize the, the, the clinical trials. First, clinical trials generate a huge amount of data. Most of you use a manual, oh my God, uh, too many written, so many errors. Uh, use insecure email is approximately two thirds of, 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 of researchers. Uh, we spend three hours per week hunting for clinical trial related documents and the number of documents at this tough center for drug, uh, for drug uh, development in the US uh, it, between 2000 and 2003 there were approximately 105 procedures per protocol and now uh, rose 49 percent. So it's impossible uh, to follow this, this system and data monitoring and record keeping comprise between 30 to 66 percent of total cost. So exchange and information via traditional, non-secure, inefficient, and not reliable audit methods is costly and time-consuming, and we need to go to the, to the cloud, okay? So we go to the cloud, and uh, this platform uh, is hosted by an outsource provider, supplies the infrastructure, and provides support. Documents are stored online centrally in a secure, and more important for for a try comprehensive, auditable manner, exchange uh, timely, faster, and more accurately information, disseminate the correct version of the documents, create a tailored list uh, for the investigator, distribute information concerning to the safety of the, of the drug, and improve the communication uh, among st uh, stakeholders while complying with the constantly timely regulatory seen in an auditable fashion. The five point is that we need to change the clinical trials. Clinical trials, oh, the typical one is we compare uh, arm A, B, C, and D, uh, uh, A, B, C against placebo. We perform a phase two clinical trial. We stop the trial. We analyze the trial. And then we decide to move to a, a, a phase three clinical trial. Why we don't, look, we don't move what we call adaptive trials, or so if one adaptive seamless design. This means that we start the trial with A, B, C against placebo, but at, at certain point, we realize that uh, ARM2 don't make sense to continue because the dose is ineffective for, for any reason. So we can now move these people from this, this arm to another one, to, for instance, A or for instance, C. But you see in engineering analysis, we also drop arm A, and people from A and B can move to C or to placebo, and so we enrich the, 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 the clinical trial. Uh, this is the way of, of adaptive designs in clinical trials. It's a design plan prospectively that uses cumulative data from subjects in the study to decide at any stage how to modify the aspects of the ongoing trial. So we begin the data collection, we analyze the available data, and so probably at this point we decide, we, do we continue with arm B? No, or yes. Uh, if we said no, this, this arm is, is out of the, of the, of the, of the clinical trial. Uh, if you say yes, we continue to review and we continue this. And we, uh, as you can uh, imagine, we uh, uh, save time and save uh, money. 
This is a clinical trial, the first one I know that you, yes. When, when, you, when you stop uh, one group and you transfer the patients to other groups. Um, you can transfer or not, mm. okay? There are specific rules. If, 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 if you want, I can show you the rules at the end of the, my presentation. Because it's very, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. It's not easy to, de to, to, to design one of these trials. I, I present to you this, it seems, oh, it's very easy. No, 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 my God. This is, this is pretty difficult. It takes in, in a calculation at least six months, extra months, as compared to a, a normal clinical trial. What about um, the, the fact that they are not naive anymore? They've actually been exposed to other drugs. So. I know. I know that. Let me show you this. This is, this is a typical, this is the first one who used this system. This is a clinical trial that was, uh, those, this is the Ward 5, and you, here these are uh, diabetic patients. Uh, as you can see here, almost 1,100 patients. Uh, they were receiving for at least six weeks metformin, and they will continue with metformin during the, the, the trial, and they, they were exposed to seven different doses of Dulabri. Uh, there was another group of patients that received cetaglitin, 100 milligrams, and there were another group that received placebo for this period of time, but approximately 12 weeks. And in these 12 weeks, we realized that uh, we only want to continue with these two doses. These were ineffective, and these were not uh, suitable because the, the incidence of adverse effects can be higher. So at this time, after 26 weeks, you can see that the placebo people moved to citagliptin, okay? The people from these uh, different part, these different uh, arms were moving to dolagliptin du du or citagliptin, so we, uh, we almost uh, make equivalent the, 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 the patients. And we follow for 52 weeks, that's the first analysis, and for 104 weeks. And as you can see in this 104 weeks, we can compare seven doses, seven doses of dolagliptin and against placebo and against citagliptin. Uh, another change is that usually, up to now, we are accustomed to uh, uh, the development is uh, phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, we applicate this uh, evaluation in the uh, European Medicine Agency, and at the end they said yes or no. Uh, that's the answer. Yes or not? But we need to change because we are now more, there are some, I'm thinking on oncology, there are new drugs that really represent a, 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 a promising drug for an, an unmet medical need or for an organ disease or for a, a emergency treats. And in this case, I just apply, I mean, I develop the compound, but when I'm in the, in, at the beginning of phase three, I asked for a, a, an initial license on this particular cancer, but I continue to study the drug. So first I get an initial license for the treatment of this particular cancer, but I continue and I increase in the number of patients moving on, on, the, on, on clinical trials, and this is the example. Uh, I select this compound, nivolumab, because he received the price of the most important, uh, most important advantage in clinical oncology in the United States. And you see, 2014, uh, please note, one, uh, in, between 2014 and 2016, he, this drug received seven licenses. They start with uh, uh, advanced melanoma, then uh, uh, lung cancer, then uh, wild type melanoma, then advanced lung, lung lung cancer at, at the end, treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. And probably at the, in two, three months, we'll receive another two licenses. So, but this is, not, this is not what I wrote. This is what the NIH says in 2015. And it's pretty tough. They said, we need more evidence to inform decisions that lead to improved, efficient, and affordable care. High quality evidence generated by conducting randomized clinical trial is lacking, and in fact, very few uh, class 1A recommendations are present in current guidelines. And many, many recommendations 
came from expert opinions. Second, in the absence of evidence, treatment decision is based on personal judgment and knowledge of the patient. Third, the kind of clinical trials needed to provide medical evidence to support treatment decisions are, for the most part, not being done because the majority of clinical trials are too small to provide sufficient statistical uh, power to definitively answer clinical questions. They fail to address clinical treatment priorities and or suffer from shortcomings in design and execution. Third, because data from cl many clinical trials are not reported in timely and transparent ways. And finally, many findings published in peer-reviewed journals are fundamental and reliable. That's, I think it's these two last, uh, pretty tough, right? So there's a growing concern that the results obtained from clinical trials may not apply, may not apply to a real situation, real world situation. And many, and many means this, this, this is the, 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 the original publication. Many advocate to move to a learning health system which uses electronic health records and advances in information technology and informatics to create a large complex sets of data, big data, produce a culture of continuous learning at lower cost. This is the second point. The data collection for clinical research must become more embedded in routine clinical practice at the point of care. I mean, for general practitioners, not only the big, selective, and sophisticated hospitals, to engage more patients, clinicians, and sites. And clinical charge should be embedded with a system of healthcare where evidence is rapidly and continually, continually fed back into clinical care, and clinical care itself will inform uh, the further development of medical evidence. And now we reach pragmatic clinical trials. And as you can see here, who developed clinical trials, randomized clinical trials versus pragmatic. Here are researchers, here are clinical decision makers, patients, clinicians, administrators, and policy makers. My God. Big change. Uh, what is the purpose? To determine the cause and effects of treatment. No, no, no. To create generalizable knowledge, improve care locally, and inform clinical and policy decisions. Uh, which question does it answer? Can this intervention work under ideal conditions? No. Does this intervention work under usual conditions? Who will be enrolled? A cohort of patients with explicitly defined inclusion and exclusion criteria. And here is diverse representative populations for whom the decision is relevant. And we collect from uh, what is a study, a biological and mechanistic hypothesis? No. To compare balance of benefits and risk of a bi biomedical health intervention at the individual or a population level and so on. Please, this is, this is I told you, this is not uh, what I wrote, but this, you can see here, is NIH collaborative. Okay, so, this is the first trial, and this is the adaptable trial. It's uh, trying to answer what is best, 81, uh, the best option, 81 milligrams, once daily aspirin versus 325, 20,000 patients. These are the primary endpoints and the secondary endpoints. And uh, you can see if you look for adaptable, I just already did it. Okay, I touched when it was the previous presentation and included 28 different hospitals, well, excuse me, 28 different cities in the United States. Uh, of course, uh, the previous speaker, Basil, mentions Duke University. Duke University is behind this, all this movement, okay? So they use the, the web portal follow-up, as you can see here, and uh, they, they have a, a, they develop a, a network, and uh, this is the first, the first uh, example of, of a different type of clinical trial. Of course, better than my talk is that you go to this publication that was published by by Jones, uh, 2016, and Jones is the main investigator of the adaptable trial. And finally, we are accustomed to use this type of studies. This is uh, 
phase uh, two clinical randomized or non-randomized clinical trial. We study in a 200, 300 patients, and we move to a phase three clinical trials with thousands of patients. But now we have a new way of doing uh, some clinical trials if we are lucky enough to perform what we call personalized medicine. In cardiovascular field, it's pretty difficult because most of the diseases are multigenical and multifactorial. Okay? But nevertheless, here we have the, 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 the phase two is control group, drug one, A, two, three. I mean, we have different drugs. We identify the patients because they have a particular mutation, and we can see that of these different, uh, these uh, six different arms, at the end, we, uh, in the first phase, we only keep three, and at the end, we only keep two. So this phase three clinical trials can be performed not with thousands of patients, but just with 300 patients. Does it happen in cardiovascular field? Yes, yes. At the present time, I, I know that in, at least in hair failure, uh, this is a paper we published last year, uh, there, there is uh, this, this uh, enhanced therapeutic benefit of, of uh, isosorbide dinitrate and hydroalazine in Afro-Americans with this particular polymorph species in, 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 in this gene. Bucindol, you remember this is the only beta blocker that is, does not reduce mortality, okay? This compound has received a special track in the United States because people with this particular genotype, this patient has a significant reduction in atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. So will be commercialized for patients with hair failure to improve hair failure and to reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation and flutter. And of course, the cloranone and people with this, with this mutation in phospholandan gene, uh, whether the cloranone reduces disease progression and slow the onset of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or arrhythmo arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So, I finished my presentation. We need a sea change in efficiency to conduct clinical trials. For me, the most important point is we need to understand the drug before we move to clinical trials, bivotal clinical trials. Second, early human validation to identify the population most likely to benefit using, as I already mentioned, imaging and biomarkers as surrogates to predict clinical efficacy and safety. And of course, for me, it's very important that uh, we, I will go to the consortia because of this uh, sample banking uh, for present and future clinical trials. New approaches to conduct ran large uh, randomized clinical trials, as I already mentioned, replace site by consortia, decrease administrative burden bureaucracy. This is terrible. I think this is one of the main standardized uh, trial design, single IRB and project management, and the United States in 2015 and 2016 the FDA recognized that because of the bureaucracy, less and less American people, less and less American hospital are involved in clinical trials, and they need to reverse this situation. Incorporate primary endpoints based on the mechanism of action, uh, improve how information is exchanged among partners, the cloud computing, uh, became familiar, familiar with new approaches for the designing analysis of clinical trials, adaptability, registry-based, I didn't mention a single word, but in this paper of Jones, you have another beautiful example and pragmatic clinical trials. And that's all. Thank you for your attention.